that uh, look a little bit like the structure of something rather than the something. And burlap on the other side. But I wanted to show you just some other pictures. Um, Okay, this is um, in his studio, me taking pictures of him in the process of making the works. Um, why we can't see more? The pigments in Phnom Penh. Uh, this is uh, him going out to get the pigments that he uses in his house, in the beginnings of works. Just to give you a little bit of, this is how he, his studio is on the edge of the Mekong River and in the garden there was a swimming pool, but the swimming pool has half fallen into the Mekong River, so you can't put any water into it because it's half a swimming pool. Because of the incredible, unfortunately, <laughs> dredging of the Mekong River to get sand by Chinese companies <laughs> to build in China. So there's a lot of dis destruction of the Mekong River, also with the damming of the Mekong River. It's one of the biggest ecological problems of e Asia, is the Mekong River. Uh, and, and parts of villages are even falling into the water. It's like a disaster. Okay. <laughs> so he works in this edge of capitulation. And that's his studio. What else? Well, I've shown you what. Just a few snippets before we read, so we know what we're talking about. Um, these are earlier works of his in the Asia Pacific Triennial in Brisbane. Before, there were three dimensional works um, that create this almost like a story landscape. And so I wanted to go visit him in um, Phnom Penh. Okay, so now to go back to our PowerPoint. This was the room in Castle. And next to this room, where you see his works, this is his works. You see in the room just next door, right outside in the corridor, was this painting. Oh, why did you do that? I don't understand. Wait, ask. Um, You need to do it from the current slide. Mm. There's something magical down here. If you hit, when you get there, hit that image. Do that. No, the one on the right, the one, that, the, the little one on the right. This little, um, where's he going to? That one that just says this. Yep. OK. So this I is a that painting. Today, so I'm very proud of that one. <laughs> this is a painting by Vanat. Um, who is an older, uh, you could say almost an outsider artist, in the sense that he wasn't trained as an artist, he was trained as a sign painter. And he is one of the five survivors of the Tolsang prison. In, during the Khmer Rouge period, there was this prison in Phnom Penh that, where many, many people died. And one of the people who did not die of the five was Vanat, and that's because he was a painter, and so he was doing these portraits of Pot Pot for all the different provincial offices in Cambodia, all over. So we went to visit uh, uh, Sophia Peach, was a child when he left Cambodia, and went to Thailand, was in some refugee camps, learned to paint and draw in the refugee camp, ended up in the US, studied art in Chicago, uh, knows about Arte Povera, and interesting that he did that, and went back, decided to do reverse diaspora, go back to live in Cambodia, rather than feel like an emigre in the US. 
uh, because he was rather not a child when he moved, so he he's not born in the U.S. or anything. So, and he basically has set up the entire art community in Phnom Penh. You know, he he was a great. He went to see Vanat because there are very few years of difference in age, and Vanat had this completely different destiny than so Pip, almost by chance. And so this question of one's destiny is, is a question. So let's uh, let's read, because he says it much more eloquently than I can, this story of his work. So um, I write to him on the 6th or the 8th of June, 2008. 11. 11, sorry, 11. This was after I had been on a trip to Cambodia. Uh, and I, we had visited Vanat. By the way, Vanat has died in the meantime. Mm. Uh, what page is it on? Sorry. 16. 16. Okay. 16. Okay. 60. 60. 60. 60. Okay. So, dear so uh, a ruminate, uh, uh, the subject I write is a rumination Vanat. Dear Sophia, I hope you are well. I have been thinking about our visit to Vanat and how moving that was. I remember that I was very moved by the fact that he had these marks. So, I mean, he, he was, well, I can't tell you. It's too long. Then it goes again, read it again. So I think as artworks on their own, his paintings are, however, not really high art. And it is therefore difficult for me to include his work in Documenta directly. So Carolyn is saying that it's, this is really problematic, you know, to be even using the term high art. So I put it in inverted commas, because uh, I'm very wary of contemporary art curators that are just including in contemporary art exhibitions traditional artists out of a sort of a false democracy, when actually they're throwing these things into an environment that is not necessarily the environment where they are best appreciated in or understood. So I was weary about the pitfalls of that. I am wondering if by chance you would be interested in including a painting of his inside the space of your own presentation. In the end, we didn't. It was next door, in, in the hall next door. I know it might sound crazy, but on the other hand, to have this complete opposite of your work, a sort of alter ego embedded within a space of modernity as your, quote, non-painting, unquote, painting suggest, could be weirdly interesting and generous, too, towards Vanat. A sort of contradiction in the space <coughs> itself. What do you think? We could frame it as his own work, but hosted by you. So I was thinking that a solution to it is that so Pip invites Vanat because there's a real relationship there. There's a years of, you know, some people would occasionally buy a painting by, by Vanat to su support his dialysis and so on. Please feel free, feel, please feel very free to disagree, Carolyn. And so Pete writes me this incredibly long email, um, not very many hours later, just five hours later. Dear Carolyn, it is nice to hear from you. I hope you had a nice time in Siem Reap, <laughs> because after visiting him, I went up to see the, the um, old um, Angkor Wat mm -hmm. uh, before returning to Germany. It is nice to hear from you. I hope you had a nice time in Siem Reap, and hope your daughters enjoyed the trip as well. It was a real pleasure to have you here. This is because uh, occasionally, it's true, uh, I would have my daughters come during the and, and we would spend some days together, and, and they, I took them to Hanoi and so on. Of course, for the record, and it's correct, I paid for every <laughs> plane ticket, every meal of theirs, and every any extra cost in the hotel room, obviously. And they didn't always come, but they came on four or five or six trips, and you see them in the logbook, my daughter. You see my dog. You see various people. Okay. Um, since you had mentioned including Vanat in the exhibition in the last email, I've been thinking. In my mind, Vanat and Zvan Kane are two very important artists of Cambodia. Zvan Kane is another artist that is an outsider artist that we visited, but I'm not, we can't go into that. Uh, both are well known here, but Zvan Kane is much more popular with everyday collectors, and his works 
have been has been shown. We didn't correct the emails. Has been shown in many countries and also in commercial galleries such as Java Cafe and Meta House. Well, Java Cafe is actually a cafe in Phnom Penh where they hang things on the walls. It's not exactly what I would consider um, commercial art world, but you, you can sell works there. While Vanat's work has received limited commercial success for obvious reasons, in 2005, when I organized a show called Visual Art Open, both were a kind of highlight artist. Vanat was in bad health and could only contribute three paintings. At the same time, I was being courted by a gallery from Norway, which was part of a museum called Vestfassen Kunstlaboratorium, just outside of Oslo. That museum was founded by a young artist named Morten Viscom. Morten came to Cambodia, and I had taken him to see both Sven and Van Vanat. Subsequently, Morton commissions by Ken to do a group of 20 or so canvases of his trip in Cambodia. He would write descriptions for him to paint scenes from his visit to Tuol Seng and the Killing Fields, among other places. I remember a strange one where the painting depicted Morton digging dirt with bones and stuffing it in a bag. While he couldn't commission Vanat to paint, he bought the three paintings through me, as he had already returned to Norway. Of course, this is extremely problematic. In the summer of 2006, I went to do my residency in Westfossen. There, Morton had made a room installation with Vanat's paintings, newspaper articles connecting to anything about the Khmer Rouge and other photographs, which I can't remember. And on the floor, in the center of the room, a map of Cambodia made of dirt, which looks like it's been taken from Chong Ek, the killing fields, with small bits of bones and torn bits and pieces of black cloth. I think there was the word Cambodia in Norwegian written on top of it, although I'm not clear on this one. That painting of Van Kay of the dirt collecting scene from the killing field was not there, I think. I remembered asking him about what he did with Van Kay paintings, and he said he combined it with other things and, quote, sold it as a very high price, unquote. I'm telling you this, not as a reaction to the idea you had proposed, but of course he is. He's worried that something so incredible, would, uh, problematic, would occur in why would I have this impulse to show Vanat. But more, just something that has happened and maybe you need to know. So he's warning me, he's telling me you must be careful, this is politically fraught, this could be a commercial endeavor exploiting the killing fields and the history of Cambodia and so on. While I can talk about Svan Kay's work more at ease, he is the painter of daily life, or modern life, is what people will say, Vanat is much more complicated. I don't want to take credits or anything here, but I had spent a lot of time with him a few years ago. I was feeling that maybe he needed to be encouraged to paint what he wants more. I was thinking that he was driven to paint his iconic paintings of the prison scenes because that was what he felt people know him by. I was beginning to think that he must have other paintings he wanted to see. For the visual art open, I asked him to make paintings without people in them. One of the questions was, can you achieve what your figurative paintings communicate without the figure in them? He came up with two works of the prison cells. One was a room with scratch marks on a wall, and one with some shackle devices with red marks on them. The third painting was a small work with two soldiers taking a tied up and blindfolded man in a landscape with setting sun. In the years that followed, I've seen paintings of his hut in the village, a boy on top of a buffalo, waterfall, and other less Tuolseng images. But his main preoccupation has always been the Tuolseng paintings. Now, to me, upon our visit, the image that stuck with me most was the one with the tree, which he says, it's not a landscape painting. It's a tree where you see these weeping willows and, and these bones under it. So it's actually a historical landscape of a tragedy. But he says it was not a landscape painting. This seems to me the first time that his work is conceptual. He painted many tree pictures before. The most memorable one of anyone who's seen his work might be one with a soldier grabbing a baby by the ankles and flipping him against a tree with all the blood and whatnot. The tree painting we saw had that feeling in it, the feeling that something bad had taken place there. When I was a painter, and after, because uh, 
uh, so Pip started as a painter, of course. I told you that as well. And he, his works for Documenta were, in a way, a return to painting, even if a three-dimensional uh, grid-like uh, works. When I was a painter, and after living in Cambodia for about a year, I had in mind that I wanted to go around different parts of the country and painted landscapes where certain important events had taken place. Might be a mass grave, a battle site that my father was caught in, the site where I had seen body parts all over the road as a child. He, he, I think I understand when Vanat says he paints because he wants to tell his story and that what happened should not be forgotten. But for sure, he's also interested in the knowledge of painting for its own sake too. He's always very conscious of colors and lines, for example. So he looks up other artists as reference, whereas Van Kay, to my knowledge, doesn't. And Van Ken is more intuitive and relied on his emotion in how he used colors. Vanat is interested in what makes a good painting. I don't recall ever saw anything he painted just in black and white. It seems to me that if he feels so strongly about the images he makes, he'd make at least one work just black and white. I had thought of commissioning him to make a painting by just using black and white. This is so peep in his own delirium about his own work, because his own work is in a way an inhibition of color. Maybe just charcoal on paper, but I haven't had a chance to really think about it yet. I am lucky enough to own a painting by both Vanat and Van K. I don't have a photo of this Van Ken one, but in the attachment is Vanat's first night from 2006. I was drawn to this painting because of the treatment of color. They were all earth tones, which seemed to me less decorative than most other works he did. And this seemed to make sense to me for the scene. It is a difficult painting to hang in my small apartment, so I have it stored away for a couple of years. Well, Carolyn, I didn't expect to write you this long letter, but here I am. I'll just leave you here for now. Let me know your thoughts. Best so peep. So, next email. I reply the next day. Dear Sopip, thank you for your long and detailed and personal letter. I cannot speak about Zvanke as I did not encounter the work nor him, and such are the chances of life. However, I am in awe in front of the little digital image of Vanat's 2006 painting, First Night. It makes me think it is a self-portrait, maybe of his own first night in Tuol Sleng. The person on the chair does look like him. And I cannot forget the strange feeling I had when looking at his ankles during our meeting, because that was what I didn't want to tell you about before. There were, you know, scars all over his, his ankles from old scars around his ankles. Um, and I remember noticing these scars, but I didn't think they were from, you know, they could be from anything, from a medical operation or anything. Um, but when I saw this painting, suddenly, I understood these feet and the scars. And anyway, um, um, I try to. I, I cannot forget the strange feeling I had when looking at his ankles during our meeting and thinking maybe the spots of discoloration were connected to past inflicted pain. I had tried to remove such thoughts as figments of my imagination, but this painting, with all the elements depicted on the ground, like lines of forces of connections in a distorted communication of torture brought back that thought. How to depict to be unfree, that condition, is amazing. Are you suggesting that we show this painting from your own collection in your space? I would most certainly agree if he were happy with the idea too. I still feel his work cannot be shown quote-unquote directly, unprotected, but harbored within a space that was also a real space of your relationship with him, too, it makes sense with all the story as well. Please think about it as you move over the next month towards Documenta, but feel free along the way to decide not to. Best wishes from Coldish Castle. So he writes several months later. It goes from July to November. So this is Documenta, the making of Documenta. It takes time, months and months and months. It's very different from the normal art world. I left him alone. He did his work. He wrote back in November. Dear Carolyn, I have been thinking about Vanat's work I own, and I agree that this piece may fit well. <coughs> first Night is a portrait of himself on the first interrogation after arriving at the prison. I'm not sure if you remember a painting at his gallery with a row of prisoners tied up and led to an S21 at night. 
this S21 is for slang because it was a previous school. It was a former school. Schools become art, they become prisons or they become art places like PS1 that mm -hmm. happens with institutions. Um, this painting is what happened after he got inside the prison. This is a very personal work and a significant work. It seems wrong for me to talk about how he paints instead of what he paints, but there is something very straightforward about his painting in terms of color treatment that's quite different from most other paintings. I think in all the work I've seen of his, some was done from memory, a first-hand experience, and others must have been from descriptions he had heard. Growing up at that time, I obviously did not experience the horror of what a person a few years older, this is the chance that he was just a few years older than I had gone through. But also because Banat, I mean, Sopiet grew up in Batambang, so in the provinces, and not in um, Phnom Penh. I was somehow protected by virtue of being young and my parents being fortunate and clever enough to not be suspicious or get into trouble. It's very interesting because when I look at, we, I've often discussed some peeps work as this not getting into trouble. So the, the abstraction of his work, the, the, again, the withholding that is behind this work, you know, that contains, you could say it looks like a prison uh, bars, but it doesn't, you know, it's also like solar wit. So there is a whole universe that is contained within the pigment and within the way that fire is used and melting that is not told. So uh, he often speaks about his abstraction as a kind of being clever enough to not get into trouble. But he speaks about that in relation to art and other forms of trouble, let's say. So it's, it's a very interesting concept that he grew up with. When I tell people of my memory, they always ask me how I can remember so much in a few, at a few years of age. And I tell them it was a bubble that I was living in. There weren't much going on, so you remember what few activities you did. All activities being anchored by hunger. Maybe it was hunger that made me remember. As an artist, I think having not had any real trauma, that's the other point, that he feels that while Vanat had this trauma, he, living in the countryside, being very young, traveling out of the country uh, very soon, uh, at eight or nine or whatever, was, um, it's a bit of what you call survivor syndrome, a kind of a guilt. But then he can tell you about having seen bodies along the way. And how can you say that it is not traumatic to see that when you're eight? So it too, it's a very strange um, mm. and interesting thing. As an artist, I think having not had any real trauma, which in some ways left me very confused in the United States, I knew that I was Khmer as opposed to being American as I was always thinking and having dreams involving Cambodia. But I couldn't make works that people expected to see. Where's the death, quote unquote, they would say. And how can you make art and not speak about that history? I always felt like being an artist was wrong. How could I choose this activity when all of my family, my parents, aunts, uncles, relatives, they were all working in factories and then other cash jobs just to make ends meet? He means the immigrants who were in America. And what part was I to make? I came back to Cambodia hoping to get away from all these questions and with the hope of finding something meaningful, anything, to confirm that I had chosen a reasoned occupation. When I got here, I found that half of my relatives, a half village full of them, were in worse condition in my birth town of Batambang, they lived in shacks and averaging seven children in a family. Life is truly very difficult. What sculpture has given me, these were the first uh, flat, flattish works in years, so he's still speaking in terms of being a sculptor, as in those pictures I showed you. What sculpture has given me is the ability to quiet most of these issues. Everything is expressed in the lines. Lines in space work as a way of focus work as a way of moving forward in the midst of all the complication. Work leads to acceptance, work leads to resistance. Vanat is a reminder of what the elder generations had to live through. 
his work express the things below the surface that is in our blood, in our bones. I had encountered many tourists, some of them Cambodian, who say things like, why can't they stop using the Khmer Rouge as an excuse to be corrupt? Why can't they just forgive and move on? Why don't they just follow the laws? Vanat's work is a reminder that the Khmer Rouge wasn't just a dream, and that it is not a choice we have to just forget, to just move on. Well, Carolyn, there I go again, but there's, here's something more immediate and pressing. When can I tell people that I am in Documenta? <laughs> you know, it's a huge news. So <laughs> let me know when I can tell everyone. <laughs> Best Sopip. <laughs> and I answer, this is the last one. Um, dear Sopip, thank you so much for your sharing and your openness to open up your memories and feelings and artistic interests to me so I can better understand your concerns. I learned from your emails so much. I learned that the practice of art making is a form of focus and discipline that keeps the mind from wandering into zones of no solution, no way out zones concerning art, society, injustice, pain, memory. The lines and form and focus are both a therapy for oneself and a therapy for the viewers, a space where the mind's ability to construct forms of illegible knowledge, illegible knowledge, to subdue the research inside the viewer before the threads of a non-text. This is what I mean by Morandi painting bottles while fascism grows or grew around him. So let's include First Night in Documenta near your work as Vanat's work, but the label can say Collection Sopir Peach. So that's the yeah. final decision. I think that's such an amazing and a beautiful way to come back down in a way because of the the process that's in the emails, the process of that working through, which brings so much kind of interesting revelation. And then when you have that with this work, the whole process of what that work is doing in your document, or whether or not people got it spontaneously, in a sense, got it formally. But I, I just think that's a very critical way of actually seeing what the, these larger things that you've actually been outlining for us, when they come down to what the practice is, yes, there is this, this, this process, it's not even, you know, we could call it an exchange, a conversation, a dialogue, but it's actually, as you say, it's a learning which required some people to himself to write the emails, to, to make that stuff come and put the, com the, the connection. Yes, I think something is present in the exhibition for everybody, even without the logbook. Yeah. Because you see so Pipich work, you see the dates, in the next room you see the painting, you see collections of Pipich. It's impossible. There's something in the colors that's also sim similar. So I think even if you don't know the mm. biographical events, in the placing of the work and in those small details you can but that's, that's what I mean. There's, there's, yeah. There is, a, you say, then that's the decision, right? So yeah. then there is um, the the moment of quote curating it in the sense of hanging it on the wall, setting up the space, doing yes. those things, putting the labels, deciding what's there. Those then become these minute, what seem to be very practical things. But behind them is this ethical, historical, yes. political, personal depth. Yes. That evol evolves with the conversation with the artist. Yes, in the best of cases. In those yeah. cases, yeah. and with the travel, cases. and yeah. with the being, and with the doing, etc. Yes. Which therefore makes this idea of the the no concept concept have this very deep sense of what it could produce. Yes, that's interesting. Yes, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's very interesting. Because if you have the concept, it doesn't allow for the conversation to occur. If you don't, you'll have a kind of commitment yeah. that opens up the conversation. Yeah. Questions or comments or thoughts? And this, this is kind of a stupid question, but I think it's maybe useful. But so how, um, was there very much painting or do you think, I mean, I, I pick on painting kind of as an arbitrary example of something which um, uh, 
something which might come up as for example in that kind of narrative um, where you suddenly come across a painting which hits you or, or, and then you're sort of put slightly at a juncture with the tendencies of contemporary art to move away from particular mediums. So how, how, how do you kind of reconcile, um, how open can you be is, is kind of my question. Open. Uh, did you see the documenta by any chance? Or? No. No, okay. Uh, so you're asking, well, there was a lot of painting actually. Yeah. That's sure. In the documenta Halle, there was mostly focused on painting. Uh, Gustav Metzger, uh, that's where Jan Le was uh, from Beijing, and um, um, Etel Adnan. Uh, but it's not about painting no. for me. Um, it's about what stories we can tell each other so that other stories can be told. So um, there wasn't even only art, as I mentioned. There was also uh, agriculture, <laughs> yeah. seeds, quantum physics. There was so much. There was a philosophy seminar in one of the uh, gallery spaces of the Friedrich Channel. Christoph Menke did a philosophy seminar every week. Uh, so there was, I don't think in terms of media, you know, it's yeah. not something that I think about. Um, but it, was, it is an interesting question because yes, some of us question. did go round with particularly a sense not of the mediums but in the sense that uh, um, what kind of painting could find its place mm. in this and there were what was interesting for me, I just in my, in my own memories of this, which was just coming across things. So walking down the street thinking, you know, so far I haven't seen everything, and then coming across this unbelievably exquisite installation of Francis Alice's oh, yeah. paintings, or less, who was, um, you know, completely known to us because there's been a, a big uh, show, um, Francis Alice, who's, I think, French, he lives in Mexico, mostly known for. Uh, things collaborative things with him, and then films. He did a film, for instance, of walking along the Green Line uh, with a, a can of green paint, mm -hmm. sort of you know, literally pouring it. So that kind of thing. So suddenly discover these amazingly beautiful little paintings. And then what you said, Etnan, Adnan, I, I tell Adnan, Etn, uh, mm -hmm. who was you know a, um, a Lebanese artist, is that yes. right? Who uh, you know a woman of about 70, 80 or something. Not she was the oldest, maybe, artist in the Yeah, not, not known at all, but sort of, again, and you'd had her palette knife in your brain, but, you know, the yes, brain exhibition. Yes, we didn't mention the brain, but... Um, but we, 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 we're going to... It's hard to do that, other. because... But, I mean, these were um, amazing, but it's that... There she is, okay. This is uh, talking with a ten. So, you know, again, that kind of discovery, not of this painting, painting, you know, this which is, is why, you know, the Richter kind knife. of painting, the Here's sense that somehow knife. we've got it. But they, they were That's all... the palette knife that yeah. Griselda's talking about, which is near these destroyed objects. And you were saying? Yeah. Which then, you know, um, I mean, just were breathtaking. So they thought, you know, this was a revelation and very fascinating and in, in the works. That, but it was all sorts of things where that concept For of painting. painting capital P that has this hegemonic space in the modernist memory and also now seems to be technically displaced but is preserved by the fact that these great white men painters get, you know, paid so much for their paintings. This suddenly undercut that and allowed it a different kind of um, Here's the space. Francis Alice. Yeah, you see, you just went so into this lovely shop. It was an old bakery, it was an ex-bakery. Or bakery, it said. And the, they, I That's mean, Francis right there, and oh, there's a the little painting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were just, they were tiny, and so it That's was a Francis. really... Interesting that that uh, thing. They began to find other works that worked in that manner. But these paintings all have stories. This is yeah. very important to me. Uh, these are uh, referencing color bar codes in film. You see, gray, yellow, cyan, green, magenta. So you had a clue that this these paintings are not about painting. They're about film. And. He put that in there so that you would know that. And the film is this that he made in Kabul and showed it in Kabul. And it's called Real Unreal. But this film was not shown in Castle. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that there's a story about 
going to Afghanistan, working with people in Afghanistan, doing the seminars, doing the film about f f real and real, meaning real and real in the media, the construction around what is Afghanistan, what it isn't, but also the film real, the end of film, the Taliban having uh, burnt the film, and him making this film, rolling it down, the, and, but, but not showing the film in Castle because it would be wireistic and it would be orientalist and exoticist. So it's on the internet, you can see it on the internet, anybody can go on and watch it, real and real, but in Castle, to withhold one's tongue and to show the paintings that somehow refer indirectly to the oh. existence of this film. So each, yeah. each painting, whether it's a Tel Adnan or, I mean, it's like, not just about the painting, if that's an answer to you. It's a kind of, the paintings are there, or for that matter, the installations are there, or for that matter, the films are there, or for that matter, anything is there, because it relates to some sort of a story that we tell each other. Mm -hmm. And that story can be a story about trauma and uh, negotiation of trauma in Cambodia, or it can be a story of the blowing up of the Bamiyan Buddhas, or it can be a story of the burning of the books in Castle, or it can be a story of the uh, girls' reformatory, or it can be a story. There are story. There are hundreds of stories in Documenta 13 that are related to the works, but that are not necessarily the works, nor visible in the works. But the works are somehow consequences of the stories, or before the stories occurred. So you can't really say that it's like an exhibition of painting. It's more an exhibition of stories that sometimes are related to paintings, mm. if that makes sense. So how you can look at a painting and also um, see it within this broader picture within which it comes into the world. Mm -hmm. But also see it for itself. I mean, you see a Charlotte Solomon for itself, as well as somehow, I mean, yeah. you've actually questioned the fact that, that one tells that story <coughs> always. You know the story of the biography of Charlotte Solomon. But I, I think there's another story. See, I, yeah. I don't, I just don't go for that story. But you're right. right. There is another story. So, yeah. I think I'm going to liberate you, Caroline, Car Caroline, because you've been talking and teaching since 9:30 this morning, uh, and you have this infinite energy and so forth and that can can go on. But I think um, we should stop now. Okay. And I think you've actually all had kind of an extraordinary thing that you will remember this. <laughs> what do I do to Lise? I actually had this particular opportunity. Um, Carolyn is going to be talking more about some artists, I think tomorrow, at one o'clock in Chemistry D, which is a lecture theatre between the Parkinson Court. If you go from the Parkinson Court to come here down that long corridor that looks like something out of a 1960s French film. Uh, Le Le Chemistry Theatre Lecture D is on the way down there. So one to three, she's going to be um, also talking to the fine arts students, but it's a big lecture theatre, so you're most welcome if you want to come along there. Um, I'm going to just stop that. <laughs>